Almost a century ago, on an average workday, Scottish bacteriologist Alexander Fleming walked into his laboratory in St. Mary's Hospital and stumbled upon something remarkable. Ah! I forgot to put a lid on this bacterial culture. Now there's mold all over it, I'll have to throw it away. Huh? What is this? Fleming noticed that the patch of mold in the petri dish had no bacteria growing around it. This is crazy! The mold produces some sort of substance that prevents the growth of bacteria. But what should this mysterious compound secreted by mold belonging to the genus Penicillium be called? Fleming thought long and hard. I know! Bob! Eventually, he named it penicillin, and with that, the science of medicine entered a new era. Penicillin, you see, was the first antibiotic to be used widely, giving us an awesome new weapon against nasty, unfriendly bacteria. Not like we hadn't been able to kill bacteria before, the various chemical and physical disinfecting methods worked like a charm outside the body, but their internal use was somewhat limited due to them killing not just the germ, but the patient as well. Antibiotics, on the other hand, are only toxic to bacteria, but pose next to no danger to complex creatures such as humans and animals, which means they can be taken as drugs against bacterial diseases. Before the age of antibiotics, an infected wound or a case of pneumonia could mean a death sentence. Don't you worry, sir, your corpse can be easily disinfected. And sick pets were just shot dead and replaced with new ones. With the discovery of antibiotics, previously deadly diseases became effortlessly treatable minor inconveniences or disappeared altogether. We can't even imagine our society today without antibiotics. If antibiotics stopped working all of a sudden, we would see the Dark Ages return. With working internet, of course. The potential ability of bacteria to resist the effect of a given antibiotic is called, well, antibiotic resistance. There are many different bacteria and antibiotics, so some species of bacteria are just immune to some types of antibiotics from the get-go, which isn't much of a problem because they are vulnerable to others. Antibiotic resistance acquired over time is much more dangerous. Its appearance is a natural phenomenon caused by a random mutation in the bacterium's genetic material, but in the beginning it very rarely provides 100% protection. The newly mutated resistant bacterium Oh, look at the cute thing, is only slightly more resistant than before, and even that is meaningless if no antibiotics are around. Resistance might even be a disadvantage if keeping it up requires energy. Why are you wearing a helmet? To look pretty. Bacteria with freshly acquired resistance may very well find themselves losing the competition for resources against their normal peers, and if antibiotics are thrown into the mix, resistance only means getting killed in two blows instead of one. A newly developed resistance, therefore, rarely leads to a bright future unless, unless we underdose the antibiotics. Given in a lower dose or for a shorter duration than needed, antibiotics may be able to clear the normal bacteria, but not the ones with the laughably feeble resistance. This leads to the resistant germ losing its competitors and filling up the void with copies of itself. Where there were only a few barely resistant mutants loitering about before, there are millions forming a population now. And the more of them there are, the more opportunities can arise for a second mutation, increasing the resistance slightly further. This setup is very similar to the previous one, but the whole population of bacteria leveled up, so to speak. The slightly resistant germs of the first level now make up the normal population, while the more resistant ones are the mutants. 
The same underdosing trick can be performed on them as well, but this time around a higher dose or a longer treatment is necessary, considering all of the germs of level 2 are at least slightly resistant. And we're at level 3. If we continue the process, we will slowly but surely develop ever more resistant bacteria, until even epic mega doses of antibiotics will fail to make a dent on them. Repeating this with several different antibiotics, we eventually arrive at a germ that most antibiotics can't even touch. The Superbug! It's only super in terms of resistance though, otherwise it's probably not even average. <laughs> Dude, you can barely move. Shut your face! Oh crap! Experts, therefore, aren't really fond of this term out of a comic book, instead they say multi-resistant or multi-drug resistant, or if the germ is able to resist every known antibiotic, pan-drug resistant. To reiterate, resistance emerges spontaneously, we have nothing to do with that, but resistance sticking around and spreading is facilitated by antibiotics because they kill the competition. And this is not dose-dependent. Whenever we give antibiotics, no matter if justified or not, or in what dose and how long it's given, there's a chance of selecting for resistant strains. A slight, but not a zero chance. Underdosing considerably increases this chance by letting weak resistance get a word in edgeways and gradually get stronger and stronger. The emergence of multidrug resistant bacteria is not something that happens overnight because it's an evolutionary process. Just like Homo erectus becoming Homo sapiens or the grey wolf turning into the super advanced pug. <laughs> It doesn't take millions of years though, because bacteria grow in throngs and produce a new generation in minutes or hours, which makes adaptation to antibiotics over generations remarkably fast. How fast exactly depends on how easy we make it for them, by either needlessly giving antibiotics or underdosing antibiotics, or both, which is something Alexander Fleming already warned us about in 1945. Penicillin is really good stuff, but if you mindlessly shower everything with it, and not even in a sufficient dose, you'll see resistant bacteria popping up like crazy, and you'll be screwed for sure. Oh, and thanks for the Nobel. Everyone nodded. Yes, yes, so true. And then they started showering everything with antibiotics, and not even in a sufficient dose. In the early days, anyone and their mom could buy penicillin without prescription for their real or imaginary illnesses, and they took whatever low dose they pleased. I have a sore throat. I'd better take half a pill of penicillin. <laughs> Later on, doctors and veterinarians prescribed antibiotics whether or not it was necessary, you know, just to be on the safe side. They were also used in agriculture as a means of pest control and as growth promoters. When given to healthy livestock, the animals' bodies spent less energy on keeping bacteria at bay, resulting in faster, bigger meat production. This was a cheaper alternative to maintaining better hygiene and was many times done without veterinary supervision. Once inside the body of a person or an animal, antibiotics don't always break down. They are often eliminated in still active forms through various body openings and affect whatever environmental bacteria they come in contact with. Thanks to all the above, ever since mankind began using antibiotics, increasingly resistant bacteria strains have been springing up at an alarming rate to then be passed around and around by people, animals and the environment. We responded by developing newer and newer antibiotics, but resistance to these also popped up in just a few years. And who or what fell sick with a multidrug resistant, god forbid pandrug resistant infection, was very difficult to cure, sometimes even impossible. It took some time and nagging by experts, but even serious politicians started to see that something must be done about antibiotic resistance. This cannot go on any longer. 
Uh, and what am I to do now? Just put this in legislation. During the past 70 years, lots of measures have been taken and recommendations made in an attempt to reduce the unnecessary use of antibiotics, to make the necessary use more professional, and to keep antibiotic pollution at a minimum in the fields of both human and veterinary medicine. And where are we now? Enough, enough! Is there any good news? <sighs> so far, there has been no smashing success. But why? First of all, regulations regarding antibiotic use differ from country to country. In some places they are practically non-existent or cannot be enforced and local circumstances favoring irresponsible drug use are still hotbeds of multidrug resistance. And superbugs don't stop at borders. And second, it's just not realistic to regulate every minor detail of drug use. Therefore, the constantly updated action plans of international health organizations don't only emphasize regulations, but education as well. No law stops you from licking ice cream off a polar bear's palate, but you don't need a law to tell you it's not a good idea. How awesome would it be if people thought the same way about the irresponsible use of antibiotics? Mainly the professionals working in human and veterinary medicine and the pharmaceutical industry, politicians, large-scale antibiotic users, but to a lesser extent anyone putting their hands on antibiotics. This includes Granny Sue and her grandson Little Timmy as well. So what can the average person do to delay the drug resistance Armageddon a little bit? First, only use antibiotics when prescribed by a doctor or a veterinarian for a specific purpose. Not all diseases are of bacterial origin and even the ones that are don't always need antibiotic treatment. Your dog's mild diarrhea, your cat's urinary issues can probably be cured without antibiotics and so can your common cold, no matter how desperate you are to get a prescription. Please, doc, I got better from it the last time too. You would have gotten better without antibiotics as well. Your physician is not going to prescribe antibiotics just to make you leave their office. Uh, oh, for fuck. Second, stick to the treatment duration and dose set by the professional, and if there's any leftover medicine, don't give it to your granddad <coughs> for his cough. <coughs> Here, Gramps, if it worked on Baxter's rash, it should work on lung cancer too. You can also avoid taking antibiotics by simply staying healthy. Don't neglect basic hygiene, wash your hands after mud wrestling, see to proper heat treatment and dirt removal when prepping food, don't play with bedpans of typhoid fever patients and so on. Be a responsible owner of your pets. Disease prevention means more than just tossing them a bowl of kibble every now and then. Just ask your veterinarian. Antibiotic resistance is an inevitable consequence of using antibiotics. There's not much we can do about that. We can, however, influence the time it takes for it to reach epic proportions. The development of new antibiotics has significantly slowed down in the past decades, so it does matter when we'll need to find alternative solutions to fighting bacterial infections. Tomorrow, or when you can already have exchangeable lungs teleported to your house in six packs. Your lungs have arrived. Let's suppose our efforts prove successful. We reduce unnecessary antibiotic use, we slow down the emergence and spread of resistance. Awesome! But what's going to happen with already existing strains of resistant bacteria? That depends on how well they can compete with their normal peers in environments where their resistance is of no use to them. As said before, resistance most of the time comes at a cost and depending on how big that cost is, normal bacteria will crowd out resistant ones over time. Unfortunately, the cost is not always that severe, sometimes it's non-existent, so the disappearance of resistant strains might take a while. 
This may not sound very reassuring, but the empirical data are promising. In the Netherlands, where the use of antibiotics was reduced in some areas of agriculture, the incidence of resistance decreased as well after a few years. Combating antibiotic resistance requires more from certain figures of society than from others. Well, much more. But the average person isn't exempt from responsibility either. So true! Only together will we win this war, or lose it. But let's stay optimistic. After all, we have already managed to stop climate change with our combined efforts. The technical information in this video was fact-checked by Akos Jerzele, veterinarian, pharmacologist, university professor, expert in antibiotics. I just I can't keep up with all the things he is. I thank him very much.